The Cleveland Cavaliers made this trade deadline very exciting as they traded like half their roster, got four new guys, and it's apparently working because they just kicked the Celtics' ass with not much resistance. So while I and basically everyone was focusing mainly on what they and a couple other teams did, I think there were a lot of smaller moves made at the deadline that could end up being kind of big. One of them is Luke Babbitt ending up back on the Miami Heat. I believe he was involved in a trade for Okaro White. Babbitt was the starting four for like all of the Heat's run last season where they won the crazy amount of games in a row and missed out on the postseason, but they still had an insane second half streak. And I mean, it's not really rocket science with him. It's he stretches the floor. He shoots three pointers from the power forward position. And he just gives them a lot of spacing, right? It fits in really well with almost everything they do because Dragic is in pick and rolls or just kind of isolations um, a decent amount of the time. And the ball is constantly swinging around with the Miami Heat. So there's a decent chance that it could end up in Babbitt's hands for an open three-pointer. I think the other guy who it helps out quite a lot would be their big dude in the middle, Hassan Whiteside. Those two together were pretty damn good last season, especially on that second half run. They were like plus 3.7 together, I believe, Whiteside and Babbitt. Um, but that includes the first half of the season where the Heat were really bad. So safe to say that that was actually really good towards the end of the year, right? And I see Babbitt just fitting in really well with what they have going on. Now they do have Kelly Olynyk playing a lot of four. Um, and James Johnson plays the power forward position as well, so... I'm not acting like Babbitt's going to play like 30 minutes a game, but I think he's going to hit some big shots for them and provide a lot of good spacing. Next, we get to Jay Crowder on the Utah Jazz. Okay, look, it didn't work in Cleveland for a myriad of reasons. Crowder did not come into the season in shape. Of course, his mother passed away in the offseason, so if there's any reason ever to not be all the way locked in on basketball, that's probably a good one. Um, but, you know, besides the fact, still was not ready to play. Maybe his stamina wasn't there, his defense, his lateral quickness, um, his lift on his jumper. And I do think there's some news that's come out recently where the way Cleveland's offense ran, where Crowder a lot of the time was just not getting the ball at all until LeBron would throw it to him for like an open three-pointer. I don't know if Crowder can really play in that style of offense. Like, sure, he's not a guy who you want to dribble the ball too much and run pick and roll in isolation or, or post up or any of that. But he is the type of guy who you can ask him to take like two dribbles off of a screen and then make a simple pass to the corner, stuff like that, or have him set screens for guys. Just have him be involved in the offense in some sort of way. I think that helps him out a lot. And I mean, he recently said something like, you know, I only get to touch the ball three times a quarter or something for the Cavs. And on Utah, I think Quinn Snyder is going to help him out because Quinn Snyder's offense is, you know, a decent amount of motion. Everybody touches the ball, and I think Crowder could just be more involved and as a result can just be better for them, you know? I think they can generate him open looks. He's, his three-pointer has been turning on lately for Cleveland, and I think he could play the power forward position for them as well, which is something they've been looking for, is that power forward who can do stuff on the perimeter next to Rudy Gobert and then if Crowder comes back defensively, I mean, my goodness, Crowder and Gobert together, can you think of a better defensive front court? So that's an interesting move that I think could end up being really good for Utah. Next, we get to James Ennis on the uh, Detroit Pistons. I called him a kid when I tweeted about this. He's actually 27. He's older than me, so he's not a kid. He's, he's an NBA veteran. He's shown some good scoring potential in his career. He's never been asked to play too many minutes but he's got some decent size, plays small forward. Potentially, you can slide him down to the four. So I think he can be, you know, hopefully just okay on defense. And then offense, if he gets an opportunity in transition, if he can attack a closeout, if his uh, defender is just daring him to go off the bounce a little bit, I think Ennis actually can do some stuff off the dribble, and then he's a good three-point shooter. I would not think that he'll be playing like a lot of minutes for the Pistons. This is similar to Luke Babbitt, right? Where it's when they call upon his number, I think he can do some stuff, but there might be some games where he doesn't play too often. You know what I mean? Uh, but we can look at the rest of the team. 
I mean, he and Reggie Bullock together could be some good shooting because Bullock's uh, outside shot has been really good for the Pistons lately. As uh, Harellabob tweeted, when did Reggie Bullock become Ray Allen? Um, he's been knocking him down, you know? And another guy, Luke Kennard, when we're talking about spacing, between Kennard, Bullock, James Ennis, maybe that can be enough, you know? You just need enough shooting out there because that Pistons offense has been kind of rough for the last couple of seasons. But of course, Andre Drummond has made improvements this year to his playmaking and of course they just have, um, they acquired Blake Griffin recently. As much shooting as you can get around those two, it should be good and I think James Ennis can be a part of what they have going on for them. And finally, Doug McDermott on the Mavericks. He was involved in the Emmanuel Moutier trade. And I think everyone, including me, was mainly fixated on Moutier to the Knicks. But when we're talking about Dougie Fresh on the Mavericks, I mean, Rick Carlisle is a wizard. He constantly has a spaced floor. And Dennis Smith with shooters around him, that sounds like a winning formula if you ask me. And of course, Doug McDermott can shoot. So expect a whole lot of pick and roll with Dennis Smith, which is what was happening anyway, so that's not too much different. But it's just a, an extra little nuance. So even if McDermott sometimes is unnoticeable, he should be providing a lot of spacing. Harrison Barnes gets his isolation game on. Barnes will also post up, operate out of the mid-range, and you definitely need uh, guys around that because, you know, if you have a non-shooter and Barnes wants to operate from around 15 feet, that can really bog down your offense. But if you have a guy like McDermott who can just chill in the corner, come across screens, get some open three-point looks, I think that could be something. And, I, I mean, I think he has a chance to play more for the Mavericks than James Ennis and Luke Babbitt do for Miami. I still think those guys can do stuff. I think McDermott could grow into, like, a real uh, piece for Dallas for a while here. I mean, it'll depend on what he asks for in free agency. I imagine it won't be too much but we're still gonna have to see one team might like him a lot but just a few underrated trade deadline moves for you that I think could end up being pretty big <laughs>